I'm about to uh, interview an amazing researcher who really understands the combination of lights and various wavelengths of light and how it impacts mitochondrial function. Uh, this researcher's name, a UK researcher named Glenn Jeffrey, and I originally heard him on Dr. Max Gulhane's podcast, Regenerative Health Podcast, and was just really blown away by the research that he was doing. And I'm so excited. Sarah and I are interviewing him today for our podcast as well. Now, number one, if you don't follow Max or follow his podcast, please do because it is a phenomenal source of quantum biologically rated, uh, related content. He does a beautiful job interviewing all of his uh, podcast guests. But number two, I was, a I was most intrigued with how different wavelengths of light impacted the mitochondria. Specifically, I reached out to Glenn because he I got a lot of interesting research from him that I was able to present at the water conference over in Lisbon. Um, but since I've also dove deep into a lot of the additional research that he's done along with other colleagues. And in this particular video, I want to highlight how red light can impact blood glucose. And so specifically, I want to talk about this through the lens of, are you someone or do you have clients? So perhaps you at your own office, or do you have clients that go to work in garbage junk light? Number one, I'm going to define what that is. And then number two, we're going to talk about maybe there's some strategies that we can play around with. Now, these are newer strategies when it comes to, um, you know, guaranteed therapeutic results. But I find there to be a huge upside in trying these red light therapy strategies and little to no downside or little to no side effects. And so for me, it's as a clinician, these are the types of things I'm looking for to help to mitigate the harmful effects of the really dominant blue lit LED work environments that we find ourselves in these days. So number one, who would be a candidate for what I'm about to recommend and what I'm about to present? Well, number one, it would be someone who does not have access to any form of natural light throughout the day. Someone who has to go to work under either fluorescent light or under the modern LEDs, which are really dominant, have a huge peak of light in the blue wavelength range, typically between 420 to 450 nanometers. Just so happens that that wavelength range of light is absorbed preferentially by the mitochondria to inhibit their activity, meaning we can inhibit mitochondrial ATP and water production, essentially in uh, shown in decreases in mitochondrial membrane potential, or that gradient of protons that builds up almost like between the inner and outer membrane of the mitochondria. Remember, there's this gradient that builds up. And that uh, buildup gradient right there provides essentially a pressure where those protons are looking to escape. And they escape through cytochrome C oxidase to make to combine with oxygen and electrons to make water. And they escape through the ATPase to generate ATP. And so we want adequate mitochondrial membrane potential, potential or this pressure buildup in order to ensure adequate production of water and ATP. Now, Dr. Jeffrey focuses a lot on ATP production, um, because I think it's a fairly new concept in the literature to think of mitochondrial water production as essentially becoming exclusions on water inside of the cell. And then that exclusion zone water is cellular voltage, healthy cellular charge. So that's number one, right? I mean, uh, so when you read his research, which I highly encourage you to do, make note that if you see a decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential, and or a decrease in ATP, you'll find that there will also be a synonymous decrease in water because the metabolism of mitochondria, the electron flow and the ATP production are coupled. Um, and so what you see changes and when you see changes in one, you'll see changes in another. Another thing that I wanna really highlight if we're looking at Dr. Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey's research is that um, the behavior or how mitochondria respond to different wavelengths of light is a highly conserved feature across species. So what I find cool about that is, whereas there's a lot of research where, for example, I've talked about how you, there's a lot of research that was done on hairless mice and rats and how their skin responds to high intensity ultraviolet light. Um, and we're, and then you have researchers translating that, that response in hairless mice to how it would apply to humans. Well, number one, hairless mice are nocturnal. Number two, they're hairless, right? And so they don't have any built-in 
um, mechanisms to essentially protect themselves from ultraviolet light exposure simply because they were never exposed during their activity levels, which would be at night, to high amounts of UV. And so that type of research is from animals to humans is not typically translatable. But what Dr. Jeffrey has shown and, all, and his colleagues as well is that whether we're talking about a fruit fly, whether we're talking about a bumblebee, whether we're talking about mice or rats or humans, mitochondria are and how they behave in response to different wavelengths of light is very similar, if not, if not what we would call conserved, meaning the exact same response across species. So you can read a fruit fly study and actually make some interesting conclusions to how humans may respond. So for example, when they shined blue intensity light, just essentially a dominant a 420 nanometer light at fruit flies, you saw a very significant decrease in mitochondrial membrane um, mitochondrial membrane potential, and also the uh, motor capabilities of these Drosophila were temporarily trashed. Basically, they couldn't move or fly as well because think about it: if they they don't have highly efficient mitochondria, they're not able to generate adequate energy production in order to fulfill flying activities. And so. All that being said is I highly encourage you to dive into this, his research if you're interested in this, um, you know, line of clinical application. And I also highly encourage you to listen to the, to the podcast that Sarah and I did with him coming out today, Friday. Um, and so feel free to check out the Qu Quantum Conversations podcast for that one. And if you're not subscribed there, please do subscribe to that so you can get notified of new episodes. Now, that being said, what does this look like when it comes to... Um, what does it look like when it comes to how the human body responds to red light? So yes, actually we know through Dr. Jeffrey's research that there are certain wavelengths of red that can be highly beneficial to mitochondria. And what I mean by highly beneficial to mitochondria is they actually have a stimulatory effect on improving mitochondria's ability to take electrons from food or electrons in general and essentially pr uh, produce from those electrons water and ATP. Meaning, you know, if those electrons happen to be coming from glucose and glucose is running through the bloodstream, it turns out that individuals who are susceptible to high blood glucose levels or insulin resistance or prediabetes -di pre or diabetes may find therapeutic benefits to using specific red light therapy strategies to help to optimize blood gluco glucose levels. Also, individuals who are not necessarily susceptible do, because they're not necessarily insulin resistant per se, but they're in a work environment that is blue lit dominant. Remember, blue light alone can cause the body to increase blood glucose levels independent of um, consuming food, right? So essentially we've got this process through a, po a POMC based pathway that I'm not going to go into detail about where we can literally make new blood sugar, um, through blue light, blue light exposure alone. All right. That being said, I'm going to share my screen because I want to highlight actually one particular research article from Dr. Jeffrey. And then also I want to highlight um, potentially what this could look like as a clinical intervention. So as I was reading this particular study, I was very much intrigued by the graph in general. Right. So what I'm going to orient you to is that there's there was two groups of people. One group of people was given what would be called an oral glucose tolerance test. Any of you who've been pregnant, uh, you know, have potentially been asked to do this, where you drink a ridiculously thick amount of like thick and extensive amount of glucose. And essentially blood sugar is measured and monitored prior to consuming the glucose solution. And then essentially every 20 minutes or so um, uh, until you're about, at, at about the two hour mark, right? To see how well your body essentially can potentially elevate blood glucose, but then clear it, which would be a measurement of how sensitive you are uh, to insulin, right? So it'd be a measurement of if, if you're progressing your body towards diabetes or not, how efficient you are at pulling that glucose from the bloodstream, you know, things like that. And so what you see in this particular graph is you see uh, the blue line on the graph are individuals who were given the glucose solution and then had their blood sugar tracked. So on the left, you see um, with the blue that essentially after at about the 45 minute mark or so post glucose consumption, you start to see that uh, blood glucose raises to a peak and then slowly starts to fall uh, to, uh, towards the two hour mark. 
Now, what you're also going to see here is uh, the, the top and the bottom. The only difference is a difference in how they measured the blood glucose, essentially either absolute blood glucose itself or um, a, a variable that is more dependent on the individuals, right? So they, so I'm not going to go into huge details about that. That's not necessarily super important here. But what is important is to see a, what you'll typically see with a standard blood glucose, uh, you know, to glucose tolerance test is a sharp increase in blood glucose and then a drop, ideally, if someone is insulin sensitive. Now, these individuals that were studied in this particular research article were individuals who were not pre-diabetic or diabetic and showed no history of blood sugar dysregulation. And so they specifically chose healthy individuals to see if there was an effect. What I find fascinating is that even in healthy individuals who have the ability to clear the blood sugar is that they cleared it in a, in a way, um, yeah, they improved their blood sugar clearance in a way uh, after being exposed to red light. Um, so they had not only a better, so anyways, let me, let me restart. There was healthy individuals and the ones that were exposed to red light also actually showed a very significant um, improvement in their blood glucose regulation. So it's like, typically we expect to maybe see uh, if we're gonna give an intervention to a group. So uh, we let's say diabetics, if I'm going to give maybe berberine to diabetics to see how it impacts their blood glucose, I might see a more significant effect in a diabetic population because they have elevated blood glucose levels to begin with, as opposed to people with normal blood glucose levels. Um, how, so I was, it, it was interesting to see that even in this healthy population, it actually regulates blood glucose, again, even optimizes it even better. So in the the group that was treated with red light therapy, you see that they also they never had the same glucose spike. So the glu blood glucose never actually rose to the same peak, and they also had a lower a lowered amount the whole entire time as they dropped back to baseline. Um, and so they dropped back to baseline in a very similar way, but in improved in a statistically significant way. So we see that the blood glucose never elevated to the same extent in spite of being exposed to the same same nasty glucose rich solution and it gradually lowered. So what are the ramifications here? The ramifications for something like this is that remember as our blood glucose stays elevated, the amount of glucose in our blood and the length of time that it stays elevated has the potential to damage other molecules that are in the blood. So that blood glucose creates essentially a stickiness factor or advanced glycation end products that can attach themselves to various molecules in the blood and render them useless. One of the molecules that we test for diabetes is a molecule that has actually undergone this process. It's hemoglobin that's been damaged by a sugar molecule. We call it hemoglobin A1C, but it's essentially glycated hemoglobin or sugar attached hemoglobin that can no longer effectively carry oxygen. Um, and so it's it's in very much something that can be measured, but it's also something that happens in, when we have even healthy people with glucose spikes and drops is we have to be aware of the fact that there are these advanced glycation end products that can ultimately wreak havoc in the body over the long term. So very cool to see that the blood glucose never rose to the same extent, and also it, it uh, you know dropped and stayed low as it dropped uh, back to baseline. Now you might be asking yourself, you know, or saying as a as a clinician, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have two. I, my clients don't have two hours to shine red light therapy on their bodies after eating a meal uh, just so that they don't get this post glucose um, spike. Here's where the coolest aspect of this comes into play. The people were not given the red light therapy during the, um, you know, when, ap after they consumed the glucose at all, they were pre-treated with 15 minutes of red light therapy before they drank the glucose solution. So what this means is we preconditioned the mitochondria to be more efficient with the red light at 700 or at 670 nanometers, which is a strong red band of light. So at 670 nanometers, it was shown just on a small portion of their back, again, not full body red light therapy either. So a small portion of back at of their back for about 15 minutes at 670 nanometers. And now all of a sudden, in spite of their body being subjected to a, a solution which should elevate their blood glucose quite drastically, their mitochondria were able to metabolically, metabolically utilize that blood glucose efficiently to make more water and ATP. So this is huge. If you think about it, if you have clients who are going to be going into work in a, you know, highly, um, 
you know, in, in an environment in which they are, I'm going to stop my share for a second, in an environment in which they're going to be exposed to this nasty blue light that can raise their blood sugar. Or maybe, you know, it's office environments are tough. There's always candy or donuts or something. Can we give our clients the best opportunity to have healthy mitochondria and regulated blood glucose if we teach them how to precondition their mitochondria before they go to work for 15 minutes with red light? I absolutely think that this can be the case. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a massive amount of it. So, um, you know, I, for one, have been starting to encourage my clients who are dealing with this particular uh, office environment or who also potentially have blood, blood sugar dysregulation to be able to then uh, shine a very small amount of red light on their body. So here is a torch that I love. I've talked about it a ton in my community by a company called Soleil Well. What I love about the Sole Well Torch is they actually have a wavelength of light in here at 680-ish nanometers, which uh, very much is very close to that um, 670 nanometer wavelength that was studied here. In addition to the other three wavelengths of light, additional three wavelengths of light that are supportive of the of mitochondrial function. So may, many of you may not know this, but mito mitochondria preferentially also absorb red light to optimize their function. When mitochondria absorb red and near infrared light, uh, cytochrome C oxidase operates better, which is where mitochondria make water. And they require wavelengths of light, um, you know, at 620, 680, 760, and 820 in order to be able to have optimum cytochrome C oxidase activity. In addition to this, when we shine red and near infrared light and the mitochondria receive that photonic input, it optimizes um, what's called the viscosity of water in the mitochondria to make the flow of protons back through the ATPase and through cytochrome C oxidase, it makes the flow happen better. It's almost like a slipperier water, a water that has less resistance to it. And so we're, we're preconditioning our mitochondria so that they can be highly responsive um, when they do maybe encounter, uh, let's say, a donut first thing in the, at the office, or when we encounter just an office with, we have the best of intentions with what we're eating at the office, but we're in an office that's going to be continually elevating blood glucose levels simply due to the light that's present in that particular environment. And so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this because there's massive upside to um, supporting clients in terms of their ability to have uh, you know better optimized mitochondria in spite of a poor light environment, in spite of a, a light environment that may try to inhibit them. And also it has ramifications in terms of blood glucose levels, especially for clients who might be dealing with that. Um, stay tuned. I asked Dr. Jeffrey, I'm going to ask Dr. Jeffrey a lot of things in the podcast about What's the length of time that we see the benefit of this? You know, so uh, does, can we precondition them for 15 minutes in the morning? How long does that preconditioning impact the mitochondria and help the mitochondria be better able to tolerate glucose and burn it for energy? So, you know, I'm, I want to talk about different times of day. So, I mean, there's a lot of fun things that we're going to talk about in that conversation. So check that out at the Quantum Conversations podcast. But in the meantime, as a clinician, I hope you found this interesting to think about having a tool in your toolbox to support those clients of yours who do not have the same ability to get outside during their workday or control their light environment, say, by turning the lights, the artificial lights off in their workspace. And so I hope this gives these clients a, oh, what would I say? A so, Some hope that in spite of having to go to work in that type of an environment, they can actually do things before they even leave for work to set their mitochondria up for better energy and better water production.